And we are live, Martin in the Philippines, from Real Talk Lifeline. So we are live. So what's the live for tonight? We're going to be talking about best lessons from outwitting the devil by Napoleon Hill. So I'll give a quick context. What I'll be sharing will be lessons that uh, coming from all of my personal development mentors to this point, 35 years old, um, I wrote down notes. I listened to the audio book just last night or sorry, the other night because it's already midnight right now. So the January 3, 2023. So how did I go about this? Um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> so you guys can see what is the quick backstory of, of this as I open my notes. Here we go. Okay, so... Let me just share this my entire screen. All right. Boom. So let me share this first. Uh, here we go. Here we go. So this guy, so this guy is a mentor I look up to. I learn from Bedros Koulian. She's from Armenia. This guy. So he recommended in one of his podcasts or one of his recent uploads that I was watching. He said to listen actually to the audiobook of Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. Quick backstory on this. Um, it was actually written back in 1938 by Napoleon Hill, but it was so controversial that it was only released after Napoleon Hill's death. So the estate finally approved for the publishing of the book only in 2011. So what I'll be sharing here now will be the notes I journaled. So I I posted this just this morning um, after listening to the audio book. The audio book was around 3 hours, 41 minutes. Again, maybe um, let me know if that's an abridged version. Uh, there was a version I couldn't find though, but if you purchase it, it's like 5 hours and 50-something minutes. So... If that's the complete unabridged version, I listened to the the audiobook. It's around three hours forty one minutes. So these are my notes, which I'll be sharing, and let me walk through it with you again. These best lessons are just the ones that hit me, and this is coming from my eyes, my heart, everything I've learned to this point from my mentors. So you might hear a mentor or two that I mentioned as I go through the lessons. So. Let's get to it. Quick check here. Okay, back. And here we go. So let me open this up. Page one. All right. So Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. Again, I listened to the audio book. This book was written in 1938. It was so controversial. You might see later on why he didn't release it. Uh, during his lifetime and it was published later on much later after napoleon hill's death only in 2011 and here we go so outwitting the devil is i like the audio as bedro schoolian suggested because you hear the voice of uh napoleon hill mr earthbound and he's talking to the devil so the devil has his own voice which for me made it even more interesting and engaging. So best lessons that hit me, first part, the devil, and then the term that the devil uses is, is opposition. So again, without the book or the audio book, wasn't really that so emphasized on religion. So you can know the opposition as God, um, I believe they mentioned the term infinite intelligence. So whatever way you wish to to understand it, you could see you could see the differences here. So the devil, all the devil is is negative thought. Uh, it's a negative side of nature or negative energy. The opposition or God, how I put it in my notes, so is positive thought. The positive side of nature or positive energy 
in the audio book, as I was listening to it, the devil describes himself as it's like the negative electron in the atom. Because there's the electron, there's also a proton or the, the positive part of the atom. So the devil is the negative or like the electron. So next one that hit me, fear. So I'm just going through my notes here as well. Uh, I hope you guys see it well on the screen. So I'm learning this. So fear, uh, quick notes of how I, I learned to understand fear more. Uh, examples of this would be poverty. Uh, what does this mean? It doesn't necessarily mean money or material things literally. It, it's poverty is anything that discourages you from thinking. So that will eventually lead to the material results later on of you know, lack of money, uh, the all this and that. So ill health, smoking, uh, cigarettes. This was mentioned in the audio audio book because it lowers your power of resistance. It, it discourages persistence. So I could relate to this. So just quick inputs on this. I did try smoking back in high school, so it felt good. You know, you're trying smoking for the first time. I just like puffing the cigarette. And then when you try smoking, when it rains, oh man, so it feels so good. And I stopped after a while because among the vices, this was true to me. It actually lowered my resistance. So I started getting immunity-wise, started getting colds. I couldn't run as far back then. So if I would go running or jogging, I couldn't run as far if I was smoking because of the impact on my lungs, my, my resistance. So that was true to me. Drinking liquor, why is this uh, part of this devil side? It actually is a thought-destroying habit. So it destroys your your thinking. So uh, overindulgence of sex. So it, this one, again, this was like uh, awareness alert for me. The key word here, though, is overindulgence. Because there are certain things in man's nature or needs and they're not necessarily bad or evil in, in themselves, but if you overindulge in them, like food, sex, like that, then it can eventually lead to destruction or downfall. So the period when Napoleon Hill wrote this, 1938, he also mentioned mass fear. So mass fear is, this is what happens on a large scale in society. So World War I happened in 1914. The other example was what they were going through, actually, the economic depression. Right? I believe it was called the, the Great Depression back then. So this was in 1929, again, during the lifetime of Napoleon Hill as he was writing it. So quick counterexample. Again, going back here, opposition or God, the positive side. Examples of that would be love, faith, hope, optimism. The opposite of here, discouraging from thinking, is deliberate thinking. So this is people who think for themselves or independent thought. Also, a person who has control over their emotions. So as you can see here, it's like the flip side of overindulgence. Again, that could be in food, sex, anything, uh, not in moderation. And then accurate thought, I put that here. Accurate thought is the death of the devil. So my quick input on accurate thought is you'll see or you'll hear later on that it's also more aligned with the truth. So accurate thought isn't necessarily knowledge. It isn't necessarily the best knowledge. The closest thing I would uh, relate it to would be wisdom or, or the truth, as simple as that. So it's thoughts aligned with that. So next big thing that hit me, there are a few big lessons that really hit here in Outwitting the Devil. This one is one of them. If they're like the top three, this one is one of them. So drifting. So the habit of drifting. This is the first trick of the devil, the habit of drifting. So what is drifting? It is when a person will do little or no thinking, um, when a person where he doesn't know what he wants in life, person who's mentally lazy, 
how could this happen, this habit of drifting? It was mentioned in the audiobook that it can happen in two ways. So one is physical heredity. So science tells us that's DNA, right? Like it's, it's passed down from the parent to the child. So there is a factor in that. Number two is also our environment. So these are two ways that really uh, could show how the habit of drifting would be passed down or, or caused onto a person. So what are examples of, of this habit of drifting? Fear, superstition, avarice, greed, lust, revenge, anger, vanity, and plain laziness. This, this closely resembles or reminds me of, of like seven, the seven capital sins. Uh, again, that was just my background growing up. So the Catholic or the upbringing of where they teach you all this the sins and all that right so that's a sign of drifting uh going through school without aim or purpose so that one is, that was a big one that hit me a lot of people fall into this me included when i went to school i didn't really know what i wanted to take who i wanted to become what i wanted to do so another sign of drifting is procrastination so why is this important? The habit of drifting, it leads to poverty. It also destroys self-determination. And it's a negative state of mind. Now here's the thing. The devil mentioned this in the audiobook. The devil has a hold of 98% of the population. So out of every 100 people, 98 people have a habit of drifting. So only two people escape this. So having just the awareness of this gives us a chance to be part of the two. So this is why I really appreciated this, this audio book. Again, I just listened to it late the other night. This is January 3, around late night. I crossed over, over midnight, just like now. And then I made my notes, finished them up, and uploaded them in the morning. So why... This one is actually helping me break the habit of, of drifting. So you might see why I'm also doing this live and sharing this. Second trick of the devil. So the youth, what, what the devil does is he uses those in charge of them. So the next trick is the devil uses the parents and religious instructors to actually do the devil's deed. So how, how does the devil do this? The mind of a child. So I'll relate this to, to what I'm learning from my personal development, psychology, stuff I've been learning, in my courses. The mind of a child from zero to seven years old, the, it's when it's most influenced. It's when it's in a it's subconscious state. It's like a sponge just absorbing everything from the parent, the environment. So the devil uses this by destroying the power to think for themselves so a lot of kids again me included we just modeled after our parents for example the fear of hell so if anyone could relate to that that's one way the devil takes control why that belief is rooted on fear and going back up here you're on this side, you're the side of fear, the negative thought versus the opposition, which is the Boston side, right? So if a child grows up in fear, and I can relate to this a lot, this is, this is part of my healing work and what I'm doing, it's the shift from fear to this side, the positive or the higher self side. Again, that's something I learned from T. Harvecker, other mentors, and that. So... The second trick of the devil is usually children just follow their parents, follow their religion, religious teachers like that. And it ends up becoming part of their, again, this is just my input, their subconscious programming. So a large part of their youth, zero to seven, and their other formative years after, the devil takes a hold of them through that. Next trick of the devil, make him believe he is acting on his own account vanity so this one before i move on to the difference of a, a typical drifter and a non-drifter i see this a lot um i'm guilty of it also too i was guilty of it i do fall into it so what 
this vanity, I believe, is very related to, I would say, like, ego or it's, like, high certainty, but for the wrong things. Like, believing that I was so right, but in reality, I was wrong. So, and then I was so certain even, like, I was so sure of myself. So, like, how many times have you, aside from me, like, I've felt that, have you felt that way or have experienced that? Because I have. So that's another trick of the devil. If a person keeps believing that or acting that way. So what's the difference of a typical drifter and a non-drifter? So I'm going on to my next page of the notes here. So again, you can follow on on the screen. Typical drifter. The main thing I underlined here, highlighted, was lack of purpose in life. So total lack of, of a major purpose in life. And this really reminded me of the value of one of the courses I took uh, with D. Harvecker, Mission to Millions. So I put that in the center of my dream board uh, over there. So mission, purpose in life. So what I put there, this was January 2019, minus to help people not give up on life. Again, every purpose, every person's mission or purpose is different. When I attended that seminar, that course in 2019, there was this young girl, I believe, I don't know if she was even a teenager, maybe 12 years old like that. Her mission or purpose was to help homeless dogs, homeless animals, like have a shelter. And she really felt that deeply. That was really her purpose. I know some people, their purpose is to, to take care of horses, something like that. So again, no judgment. As long as you have that major purpose in life, then that's actually the answer to this, to be engaged in something definite. So you can blitz. I'll blitz through this with you. Um, those watching the replay of this live, you could just pause. You could pause the video and then read through this. So some of this might sound or feel familiar to you or the side of a drifter, someone who lacks enthusiasm to begin anything. Someone who's ill-tempered and lacking in control over his emotions. I, I'm guilty of this at times. Narrow-minded and intolerant of all subjects, ready to crucify those who may disagree with him. I'm also guilty of this at times. So to be open-minded is like an excruciating, intentional effort for me. And that's what I've been working on the past years. He will expect everything of others, but be willing to give little or nothing in return. So maybe some can relate to that. Uh, maybe when I was younger growing up, I did learn later on that always give more, always give more than what I ask for. So, you know, you can learn how to handle this. He may begin many things, but he will complete nothing. So that, that, that feels like shit. So what I started to learn was if I start something, finish it, um, finish what I started. So I don't really commit to a lot of things. I learned to be more selective. But again, these are signs of a drifter. He will tell a lie rather than admit his ignorance on any subject. So what's the solution? You can learn. You can learn. So man, I, I admit that when I don't know something, I'll say I don't know. Or if I was wrong, you could bitch slap me in the face and then tell me. So... What are signs of a non-drifter? So let's focus. Let's focus on a solution, right? Non-drifter, a non-drifter is always engaged in doing something definite uh, through some well-organized plan. So you're feeling the difference already here. Has a major goal in life toward which he is always working. And many minor goals, all of which lead toward his central scheme. This part I quoted because it really, like, paints a picture or draws out like how how a non-drifter looks and sounds and feels, the tone of his voice, the quickness of his step, the sparkle in his eyes, the quickness of his decisions. Here, clearly mark him as a person who knows exactly what he wants and is determined to get it, no matter how long it may take or what price he must pay. So that one clearly describes a non-drifter. Sometimes we, we meet people like that and they're, we remember, we really remember what that feels like. If he does not know the answers, he will say so frankly. Agree. 
never blames others for his mistakes, no matter if they deserve the blame. He is an inspiration to all who come in contact with his mind. So next thing that hit me, I put here like a, a wrench. So it's like a solution. How do we fix this? So what brief message would you send to the typical drifter if you wished to cure him of his evil habit? The devil said, I would admonish him to wake up and give. So that alone uh, might hit some people because, yeah, just like now, the reason why I'm sharing this, this live, my best lessons, is because it made me feel like waking up. The points that I all marked, drew a star, exclamation point, fire mark, wrench, all of this, those are, the, those are the moments that I felt like, hey, this is waking me up. And then give, what is give? The devil said, give in some form of service useful to as many people as possible. So it can be like this. Give answers. Give wisdom. Give the truth. Give a solution to someone, right? And he must give before he gets. So that's another principle that the, the devil shares with napoleon hill here so this one again kind of was reassurance for me because a lot of times it's just a survival thing right we want to get we want to get first but it's like a universal principle or law that he must give before he gets so it's it's just how it works it's just how the universe works right so next devil's trick flattery so how, what is this? Um, a way of gaining control over people. The, th the two most common human weaknesses are vanity and egotism. So he explains later on, vanity is, in his example of the devil, it was vanity is like a woman, like when you flatter a woman. And then like about her looks, etc. like that. Egotism is like when you, when you, uh, puff up a man so it's like the male version so you you tell him how strong he is like you respect him a lot like his capabilities so it plays on the the man's egotism i've seen this in real life and at times yeah i've i've felt this like used against me or maybe i even fell into this uh at, at times the next devil's trick is failure so why why is that part of the devil's trick it breaks down one's morale again 98 people out of 100 like when it breaks down their morale it, it's also what i'm going through so again what i've been through back in 2014 over the years all i've been doing is just doing my best not to give up so failure is a very real thing and there is actually a solution here on the other side which i'll get to so I'll just go through this um, devil side first, and let's focus on the solution here on the right after. Next devil's trick is propaganda. So propaganda, um, ironically, my, my course was communication, so integrated marketing communication. So propaganda is a method by which it's people can be influenced, but without knowing it. So why does propaganda become a devil's trick when it turns into a form of dictatorship or fear? So propaganda could also be used for something good, like if it inspires or makes a person better. But the devil uses it mainly for dictatorship, fear, self-imprisonment. So you could feel the, the difference there. Another devil's trick is to bribe people. And the devil usually bribes people through their through a person's natural desires. So what's an example? Love. So this is surprising. People will say, isn't love good? Yeah, but then love can also be can can be twisted. Like a love for a person, for example, I've I've seen this a lot. I've seen this in in a mother, mothers, I've seen this in friends. They maybe even in myself, I was guilty of it. I think a person can think that I love you, so this is good for you. But is it really, right? So a line that really made me understand this is, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
So a person might fall into the devil's bride. They think, hey, I love you. So this is good for you. Again, a parent might say, hey, this is the right course for you. Hey, you should do this. I love you. But it's not really love. It's actually destroying the other person. It's imprisoning the other person. It's out of fear, out of ignorance, right? Other desires, natural desires of, of people could be uh, food. So gluttony, sex, overindulgence. So again, bribe people through gambling, liquor, flattery, egotism, poverty, greed, etc. So, so what's the solution? What's the flip side? What's the positive side of it then to, to counter the devil's trick? So a line here that hit me, Napoleon Hill, like why, why is the devil actually talking to Napoleon Hill? The devil said, you have become my master because you have mastered all your fears. So after listening to the audio book, kind of understand this more to sit down with the devil and have a conversation or an interview you really gotta face your fears like that's some gangster shit right there like if i could sit down with the devil across me you better overcome or master your fear because that that guy's the master of all fears right who you're talking to so the way is if you overcome it you master all your fears then you become the master of the devil or you're a non-drifter, you know? So every failure, so this is the, the counterpoint of failure on why it can be a, a downfall break morale. It can be a good thing. Every failure brings with it the seed of an equivalent success. So Every failure doesn't bring with it success at once. I, I really loved how this was shared, how it was balanced. And Napoleon Hill, the devil reminded that failure doesn't mean a success at once, but it brings with it a seed, like potential, right, which can grow eventually. And this will only happen when it does not lead one to quit, to quit trying. So that's how failure could actually become a virtue when the person's willpower is tested, when the person doesn't give up, when the person allows a seed to be planted, a seed of a lesson, a seed of an equivalent good, and then allows it to grow eventually. So that's how failure could become something good. Next, protection against drifting. I believe these are 10 points. 10, yeah, 10 points. So I'll, I'll go through this one by one. Again, I'll emphasize the ones that really hit me hard. Protection against drifting. Number one, do your own thinking on all occasions. So this one will be emphasized later on because the school system was mentioned. Now, again, people who went through their own environment, maybe you were homeschooled, maybe you were influenced not by school, maybe through a different type of environment. Do your own thinking on all occasions. When you're surrounded by friends, hardest ones, like when you're surrounded by your family. So that's how you protect yourself against drifting, like becoming a non-thinker, becoming someone who's just run by their own programming or, or environment. Number two, this one, this one I mark, fire mark. Decide definitely what you want from life. Then create a plan for attaining it and be willing to sacrifice everything else. So the, the reason why I marked this was it's very closely related to like making your own dream board, vision board, and then you have to, it's making that decision to just decide, which is the hardest thing to do, by the way, right? Decide that, hey, I really want this, and I'm going to make a plan for it doesn't have to be that complex. Like my dream board, a lot of the stuff there, I don't know how I'm going to achieve it. But then the plan starts to, to create or to build like, oh, this is the blueprint. This is how I'm going to get um, the cash flow of, of a rich person, Robert Kiyosaki, rich dad, poor dad. So this is, this is how the balance sheet and the income statement work. That's a plan already in essence. Number three analyze temporary defeat 
and extract from it the seed of an equivalent advantage. So we discussed that in, in failure, how it can become a, a good thing. So this is actually my process also. So usually people who go through their personal development, you take a Tony Robbins seminar, man, you even go up to date with destiny. We're trying to overcome our defeat. We're trying to turn our greatest pain into our greatest purpose or into something good, right? That's the seed of an equivalent advantage, a lesson or something good. Number four, um, I put a hard mark on this. Be willing to render useful service first. So why did I put a heart there? If you're familiar with the love languages, acts of service, that's my that's my language of, of how I express myself, how I give love. So I totally relate with this. Number five. Recognize that your brain is a receiving set of infinite intelligence to help you transmute your desires into their physical equivalent. This one I'm learning. So uh, again, a lot of the healing modalities or practices I do, like the ice baths, it's more of, of the meditation after, actually. Like when you do uh, breath work, pranayama yoga, shavasana, which is like the corpse position, when you're in that mode, that's your brain like if ever you got like a um a divine download or an enlightened moment it's like a eureka aha moment that that is the your brain receiving infinite intelligence so number six to so do this with some degree of order recognize that your greatest asset is time that one didn't really hit me yet so again for some you understand that you're already at that point in life wherein every second counts right number seven recognize the truth that fear generally is a filler with which the devil occupies the unused portion of your mind so this one hit me because it's true i shared this actually just on a zoom call a few hours ago with with my buddy or good accountability partner so this one if you have ever heard like idle hands is the devil's playground and idle mind all this means is that usually usually just how it's stating here in general when the mind is empty or not doing anything fear usually fills it or the devil right devil or fear fills it i find this to be very true in my personal experience if you are the type of person wherein you're not doing anything and your mind is filled with positivity in general man like please comment reach out to me i, I want to learn from you <laughs> like how do you do that please teach me and the good thing for people like 98 percent of the population is it says here which you can control by filling the space with faith so the way i understand faith here is not like religion because I had a bad experience growing up. Religion was shoved down my throat. It was forced, you know, memorize all these catechism points, bullshit. Faith, the way it was explained here is you just fill your mind with positive space, positive thoughts, um, everything there, like the positive side of nature, anything that is constructive, fill it with the truth, fill it with wisdom, like that uh, definiteness, fill it with purpose, like that. So, that was a really, really helpful guide for me. Number eight, I put a fire mark here because I never really learned how to pray growing up. This one was super, super helpful. When you pray, do not beg. And that's a line from the devil. So <laughs> of all the places I learned that. So deciphered, plain English, when you pray, do not do it out of fear. That's the way I understood this line. If ever I'm praying out of like desperation, meaning like out of fear, out of like I'm not worthy or something like that, it's not going to work. In fact, it's going to attract the opposite or the negative. If I pray like, oh, um, I don't want to be poor, I don't want to be poor, the more I'm going to become poor because it's going to attract fear. It's going to attract lack, scarcity. It's going to attract uh, failure like that. Because that's the, that's the energy, the vibe, right, that it's coming from. So when you pray, do not beg. Number nine, recognize that life is a cruel taskmaster and that either you master it or it masters you. So that one was, that's just like a, 
that's like a law of nature rule of life we see that so let's say a person doesn't take care of their physical health i guess growing up that's why i discovered dumbbells right if, if you don't take care of your physical health as a man you're gonna get bullied so if you don't learn martial arts or something a way of just how to stand up for yourself then people will push you around now it applies also financially it'll also apply emotionally like with relationships so me learning personal boundaries so that like a girl doesn't fucking rip your heart out or your guts out again some people like end up committing suicide not just romeo and juliet so that shit's real right so that's how life is number nine it's just I have a picture of reality number 10 fire mark this remember that your dominating thoughts attract through a definite law of nature, their physical counterpart. So be careful what thoughts you dwell upon. So this one is, a, again, like a universal truth that's been mentioned by, I believe, like James Allen, like, as a man thinketh, um, by philosophers. It's even stated in the Bible, right? So whatever you think, you become. So and this one, it just says here, the thoughts you attract by a definite law of nature, it becomes a physical counterpart. So the thoughts will either physically become disease, weakness, or it will become abundance. It will become like prosperity, you know, good health, power. So let me let me go to the next one um, that the devil pointed out here. So this is on like the negative or like the danger side. The law of hypnotic rhythm. This is like maybe the second main big key lesson from outputting the devil. So the law of hypnotic rhythm. So what is hypnotic rhythm? When a person does certain things and act. So that's another time or multiple times. That's repetition. Repetition done over a lot of times, over a period of time. It turns into habit so for example like brushing our teeth something like that it's a habit because we've repeated it so many times you don't even have to think maybe it could be making your bed it could be uh taking a shower or something like that then when it's done so many times already so many times it becomes a hypnotic rhythm this is when nature takes it over and makes it permanent so Another way, just combining all the lessons I've learned from my other mentors, my, my personal development, hypnotic rhythm is kind of, it's a different way of saying it's our programming. It's like our subconscious programming. And I also like the way it was described here in Outwitting the Devil because it sounds like a term of, of nature, which the devil says it is a law of nature. So hypnotic rhythm will also be explained later on in different environments. So I, it was a new lesson, and I, I really like it. Like it, it really made me understand a lot of things. So Napoleon Hill said, you control people by making negative thinking and destructive deeds pleasing to them. So that's, this explains why certain people are addicted to, to negative emotions or to gambling of certain vices like that, or the devil's tricks, right? So that's that's like the definition of a deal with the devil. It feels good up front, but the payback later on is way more destructive. So that's like a vice. A virtue is like the opposite. It might feel kind of uncomfortable to do at first, like, like working out, right, taking care of our health. But the pay the payoff later on, is good health strong body strong mind work ethic stuff like that right so the the payoff is you benefit so much like in multiples later on that's a virtue versus like a vice right so another good point here was on scientists because people were mentioning about the church religion stuff like that beliefs scientists actually have a religion and the devil said it's the religion of truth now these are these are the true scientists, not the scientists who get lost in in just like a quest for knowledge and then they go down a dark path, right? So 
I, I love this because when I took my um, MBTI, the Myers Briggs personality test, I took I got the result INTJ, introvert thinker like that, and it's also known as like the scientist. <laughs> so I love this because it aligns with me, and I and I believe this, right? I believe this. That is the religion. I believe it, like the truth. Masterminding. This one is a really good lesson too. Uh, not sure if this was written in the Bible or or a certain book, but Napoleon Hill said masterminding is when two or more meet together and ask for anything in my name, it shall be granted. So that's that's one way of accessing infinite intelligence. In fact, that's also the way the devil admitted why he was able to have that conversation or interview with Napoleon Hill. Na Napoleon Hill's mastermind, again, it says at least just two people or more. It was Napoleon Hill and his wife that created a mastermind for him to overcome his weaknesses, like his arrogance or blind spots or whatever. And he was able to actually have this conversation with the devil Again, however way he wrote this book, it could have been like he had a dream, he was inspired like that. But if you listen to the audio book, man, like I've listened to it two times already. On my second listen, just the other night, I wrote down notes. I feel like it's the type of audio book I could listen to again a third time or even another time and another time. I'll still be learning. So what's the first step to break the habit of drifting? The devil says a burning desire to break it. But actually, that's all it takes. So this one aligns with a lot of lessons or moments wherein when a person is just fed up or a person, the burning desire can come from like real desire, like maybe just out of love, curiosity, like that. It can also be from you're just sick of it. <laughs> and I could relate more to that. I could relate more to that, right? So the burning desire is like it's making me do this live now i'm wearing this freaking black polo which i probably never would have worn because it, it's either i wear this to a fucking funeral or if i wear it out they're gonna say i look like a dance instructor so uh, it made me wear this because i felt like hey i could actually wear this i'm talking about the devil why not wear all black right so i had a burning desire to just do it right doing this live at midnight with you guys so Next lesson, you are where you are and what you are because of your thoughts and deeds. So Napoleon Hill was asking the devil, do you become the person you are just because of your deeds, like your actions? So the devil corrected by saying, it's not just your deeds. Why? Every deed is preceded by a thought. Now, holy shit, right? This one just aligned with the lessons that I was learning. This is from T. Harvecker. This goes to also Bob Proctor on, on his lessons of paradigm. So let's keep it simple. The process of manifestation, right? T-F-A-R. Thoughts lead to feelings. Feelings lead to actions. Actions lead to results. When someone says a person's deeds, which means his actions, yeah, it's preceded actually by your feelings or your thoughts even before that. And the, the devil just verified that by saying, you know, every deed is preceded by a thought. And if, if you don't believe that, man, just like me, <laughs> I could be very skeptical. Look at our subconscious programming. Why do people do certain things? Even if we're not aware of it, the more mindful we become, we'll go, oh, so that's why I do that. That's why I act without thinking. It's because of this. It's because I learned it from my parents. Oh, it was a survival instinct, right? Oh, it's my insecurity, right? So why, why I say this shit? Oh, it's a defense mechanism. I don't want to get into a relationship. I don't want to get hurt again. Something like that. So every deed is preceded by a thought. Next lesson. So the law of hypnotic rhythm. This is like a graphic uh, representation or drawing again. Just showing... Hypnotic rhythm is actually not um, evil or bad. It's just a law of nature. So no one can change the law any more than one can change the law of gravity. So this is why I love understanding it, right? Either you could use it for good or it will use you, 
for something bad. But everyone can change himself. So this is what I like learning. The law of hypnotic rhythm could be used by the devil. Like it can be used for a negative end, or it could use could be used by God, right? Our higher self for a positive power, right? So the thing about hypnotic rhythm is it may be a great danger because it operates automatically if it is not consciously applied and it can and it will operate to attain undesired ends. So if you don't believe this, there's like a scientific reason and I'll, I'll say the Jim Rohn, personal development reason. So scientific reason is entropy. It's like the atoms, right? They're in discord, disarray, right? Everything eventually will decay, right? It will like break down. You can just look at nature, look at science, right? That's how things are. So Jim Rohn, the personal development side, he said, if you don't have a plan for yourself, right, of where you what you want to wear, you know, where you want to be, what you want to do, you're going to end up being in a place that you don't want to be in, wearing clothes that you don't want, doing things that you don't want to do. And sometimes that will hit you or me because we're like, oh man, yeah, that, that did happen to me. Why am I here? I don't even want to be here, right? So that's the side because it operates automatically. Now, if we study the law of hypnotic rhythm, and it's understood and voluntarily applied, we can attain definite desired ends. So what's a quick example of this, right? Well, make a dream board. Again, if you look at my cover photo, uh, it's an example of my, my dream board, my vision board. I didn't make that up. I put there a link of Steve Harvey, and he quotes the fucking Bible, right? A man without a vision will perish. When you have a vision then you can attain the definite desired end. It's your own, your own vision for yourself and make it a reality. So let's go to the law of hypnotic rhythm again. If you if you don't believe that this is a real thing, I fire mark this part. Every home, every place, business, every town and village, every street and community, community center, it has its own definite discernible rhythm. And if you want to know, take a walk up Fifth Avenue in New York and then go down a street in the slums. So for example, here in the Philippines, you're in Manila. You go to Ayala Labang Village. Maybe you go up to, let's say, that you let's use the malls, right? You go to Podium in Artigas, right? You're going to feel rich there. Or, or BGC, right? Bonifacio Global City. It has its own discernible rhythm. It has its own vibe. It has its own feel. And the way, the people there think a certain way, feel a certain way, and do things a certain way. Now, if we go to like freaking Tondo, Manila, right? Or like some place in the projects, right? Like that. It's not bad. All the law of hypnotic rhythm is saying they have a certain rhythm. They have a certain way of thinking there. They have a certain paradigm, usually along the lines of poverty and more of negative energy or negative vibes there. So again, this is not a sweeping statement like everyone in the slums is like that. No, you could break out of it, right, by following these, right, break break the habit of drifting and use the law of hypnotic rhythm for something positive, right? And usually those people who do it and sustain it, they studied it. It was voluntarily and very intentional. So that describes the way the law works officially, right? It can and it does modify, change, control, and make permanent one's environmental influences. So the hypnotic rhythm... It can be it can either end up destroying or it can be used to serve. So we're yeah, making good progress already. This is like maybe the third, right? So there was the habit of drifting, hypnotic rhythm. So this is the, like the third key point. 
of outwitting the devil is the seven principles he teaches. So this is like the master key through which um, a person can actually reach spiritual, mental, physical freedom. It's a way of breaking the habit of drifting. It's also, you can use the seven principles so that we can use the law of hypnotic rhythm to serve us instead of destroy us. So what's number one? Seven principles. I'll go through this as quickly as I could. Number one, definiteness of purpose. So this was kind of mentioned throughout the audio book of, of Outwitting the Devil. Definiteness of purpose. It's it's starting again with a with a purpose in life, a main purpose in life. And definiteness is like you will do it no matter what, whatever it takes. Never quit. You know, do it, do it to the very end. You know, definiteness, right? That type of energy. No space for the devil to enter your mind. So the note I put here was the only sort of definite of, of purpose is the only sort of prayer upon which you can rely. Why? Like someone might say, what do you mean prayer? Definite of purpose. All prayers bring that for which one prays. So if one is indefinite, you're actually realizing your fears, right? It will bring negative results. But definiteness of purpose and faith, it brings positive results. Again, the way I see faith is you just have a positive vision, a vision for something good, and then you hold to it. That's the definite of definiteness of purpose, right? That burning desire that whatever it takes, I'm going to do this. I will never quit like that combined with your positive vision, your result. Number two, so wait, before we proceed, this is another important note on, on definites of purpose. The answer is that both the positive and the negative charges of energy are necessary to existence. So this one, this one was a super, super, super enlightening um, part for me. That's why I put like multiple marks here. Star the eye, like, oh, I see it now. And a fire mark even combined. So what does this mean? When it comes to negative and positive, the two sides of life, right? The devil and God. One is as important as the other. So the devil was explaining, if you remove the negative side, like the electron from the atom, the whole universe, like the whole system, it will collapse. It won't be able to hold. There won't be a positive if there's no negative. So the answer is that both the positive and the negative charges of energy of life, right, are necessary to the existence. So this line was so powerful for me because it just it helped me understand and, and accept that it, it's like if i wish there was no negative in the world it's like me wishing that there was no life right it's like if a person wishes to to lift some weights and then not feel any pain right it's like it's messed up like inject yourself with morphine and then try to lift weights I don't know. It just it's just giving me a better understanding of, of, of life and how the universe works. So you could test it yourself. That line just really hit me hard. And that was one of the best lessons I got actually from this. Number two, mastery over self. So what does mastery over self mean? In this audio book, there were three appetites mainly. Um, the master over one is food so what is what is the example there a lot of people actually eat food that causes auto intoxication so i like how simple and graphic this was so when you do a cleansing of your intestines like like a enema or something like that and it made me understand like sad guru mentioned in Indian cultures, they actually do that. They actually cleanse their body in, in, in nature to get rid of parasites, stuff like that. In the book, back to the audio book, when you do that, 
that will cure already like 95% of headaches. So someone who is more sedentary, like let's say me, I could relate. If you don't clean out your system, mainly with food, you could also add an exercise there. You're not sweating it out. You're not detoxing. You're not eating clean food, salad, fruit, and then cleansing the body. It's like putting poison in your body and you're not cleaning it. So it will affect our mental everything, physical, emotional, all that, right? So that's number one food. Do is expression of sex. So the quick solution I saw there was he calls it transmuting that energy. So I found that very helpful because if ever I did have like a number one vice, it would be that. So it can become the downfall of, of a person if they can't master themselves over that, like a craving. Oh, I want to watch porn. Oh, what, like I feel like doing it. What am I going to do, right? So that's no mastery over myself. What can I do? I can transmute that energy. Turn that energy. He calls it a creative energy. You could turn that into a workout. Hey, I'm doing this live right now. I'm putting it into my purpose, right? So you can actually transmute that energy. And that he also mentioned, I think Deva mentioned that a lot of the most successful people in the world are like highly sexually charged. So they actually do this. They do this a lot. Otherwise, overindulgence in sex, the main thing it actually does is it drains you of your energy. So it, you won't have that energy or creativity to, to work on your your purpose, your passion, your business, your, again, again, your, your purpose. So that becomes a downfall of a person. Third, so food, expression of sex. Third is to express loosely organized opinions. This one, I'm trying to understand a bit. I think I get food. Number two really hit me. Number three is, I think this is more for people who just like talking a lot, I guess, or they they just express themselves very loosely. So maybe falling like into gossip, stuff like that, right? And the solution for this is accurate thinking. So, oh, interesting. Napoleon Hill was actually guilty of this, to express loosely organized opinions because Napoleon Hill is um, a journalist or, you know, that he that was his background, right? So he wrote something about he criticized the person and it, it really burned him it really kind of hurt him like that experience he had to learn from it in the past so what why are these three very important once we master these three appetites food expression of sex i guess number three is like ex expression of our self like our opinions our words right once we overcome those three the rest of the other appetites will be easier to overcome. That's what the devil said. So number three, learning from adversity. So we, we already discussed earlier from the audio book about failure, right? Failure could destroy one person's morale. It could discourage. So it could be a blessing in disguise. Why? The devil says it, it breaks the grip of hypnotic rhythm. So this one kind of, is making more sense to me. Like, why did I have to go through that, that breakup, that adversity, this pain like that? It actually breaks hypnotic rhythm. So it frees the mind for a fresh start. If that didn't happen, my way of thinking, my pattern, or like my hypnotic rhythm, it would have remained. I, in hindsight, this is very hard for me to like look at, I'm going to feel the pain, you know, the past, all that. I would be stuck in that state of feeling needy, codependent. Again, I had to learn all these terms. Very, very painful process for me. Um, I would be stuck, I guess, in, in, in a pattern. I didn't know my future, what to do with my life. It's kind of like a cycle. I, I tried to recover. Now I'm kind of like um, going through another burnout, just openly sharing that with you. But... The adversity, the failure, the falls, right? They, they have that tendency to break the hypnotic rhythm. So, yeah, I got into personal development. That was a leap of faith. 
2014, I was just free falling into the abyss. I didn't know what to do. So what does this learning from adversity mean? It, it's to test our willpower. Another thing it does is we learn certain truths that maybe we wouldn't have learned without going through the pain, through the suffering, through the adversity. And it's also just a natural law. So in life, there, there will be adversity. If not for you financial, it could be emotional, it could be physical, like health, right? a sickness. It could be like passing of a family member, a dog. It, it could be some other form of adversity, right? So what are some benefits of adversity, learning from adversity? It relieves people from vanity and egotism. I believe that like that saying of um, humble yourself or be humbled like by life, right? It's very, very true. So I truly believe that, especially after going through adversity or certain things that could destroy a person. Like I, I truly believe that. And I would never wish that on anyone else. It discourages selfishness. I believe that too. Um, that's why I'm doing this. That's how my mission, my purpose came about, right? How could, how could I not help someone if you know what that pain feels like? To change one's thought habits, so that's what it says, super key. It can break, adversity can actually break the hypnotic rhythm. And then to depend less upon material and more upon spiritual. So th these are people, in my personal experience, it's like when you go through a, a near-death experience, we, we have that opening or that opportunity it's like a moment where you you kind of get like hey yeah i mean life isn't all material and i can only do so much or have so much control over my mortal life i can i feel like i feel like i'm on borrowed time already so maybe that's my way of understanding that right so is every adversity a blessing that's what napoleon hill asked the devil the devil said no there is the seed of an equivalent advantage in every adversity, but it doesn't adversity doesn't automatically mean that it is a blessing. So we still have to follow this third principle of learning from adversity. Number four, environmental influence. This consists of all the mental, spiritual, and physical forces. So our, our environment affects us. And this is what I fire marked here. The most important in our environmental influence is this. It's the association with others. What is this? So all people absorb and take over either consciously or unconsciously the thought habits of those with whom they associate closely. Closely. So... It doesn't necessarily have to mean your family, even though like you you spend a lot of time with them. It doesn't have to mean your your friends if if you're not closely associated with them, right? So another tip here he gave, I put a heart heart mark here, the mastermind. It's actually the most effective of all environments. This is why I mentioned that they're mentors or even this this audiobook which I'm going through. Anything that we closely associate ourselves with, like the teachings of Napoleon Hill, mentors like T. Harvecker, Tony Robbins, there were some stuff from Bob Proctor, Bedros Julian, who, who recommended this audiobook. We start to become more like them. Now, I put in my, my dream board this thing after I attended Date with Destiny. I believe it was like December 2020. So one of the dreams I added was Platinum Partnership by, it's Tony Robbins. I think it's like one of the highest level stuff you can go to. You, you can imagine Date with Destiny is like $5,000. Platinum Partnership, to just enter it is like $20,000 plus, plus. Like there's there are other fees actually after that. It's the course of one year. 
So it's like a membership. It's like an inner circle to his Tony Robbins' mastermind. So you're getting access to, to, to closely associate with the top people in Tony Robbins' circle. So it kind of made me understand that. Like, that's what environmental influence is. Because there's that saying, you, you become like the people that you surround yourself with. Now, the key is the people that you closely associate yourself with. Because if you're around a lot of people and you don't want to be like them, okay, don't don't let them affect you, right? Don't closely associate with them. I'm going to focus all my time, energy, and attention into the lessons of the mentors who are helping me, who are making my life better. And then maybe you or I can become a ripple effect onto other people. So test it. Test it if it's the truth, right? If it really helps. Number five, time. So what is this principle of time? Time penalizes the individual for all negative thoughts and rewards him for all positive thoughts. So time is, is a principle wherein once we get the law of hypnotic rhythm working in our favor, Time is a principle of how it amplifies or stacks it right over a period. It will eventually, like, you know, J curve, like, multiply it in your favor, right? Or it could go against you also or me. So just be aware of that. Number six, the principle of harmony. It's this one just made me understand how harmony is like how the rhythm affects. It's just like a, a law of nature. Nature voluntarily forces human beings to harmonize with the influences of their environment. So actually, this one hits a little harder now. Have, have you ever been around certain people and you didn't like it, right? Like it just didn't match your vibe or it didn't align with your values like that. So I could relate to that. It, it's like a law of nature, if we're not on the same wavelength, and I mean, and I mean this like as a positive influence, right? You will feel it. You'll feel like something's off, something's wrong. And let's say if I feel like I'm in harmony, and you know the like the the influence or like the the harmonization of it, the harmonics is like for destruction for negativity, for, for like negative vibes, right? All that. I don't want that. So this is the next point over here is they must change their environment or remain poverty stricken. Now, poverty stricken doesn't necessarily mean money only. It can mean poverty of the mind. Poverty of the mind, like poverty, like there's no independent thought. There's no accurate thinking. It's, it's like dumbing a person down, right? So harmony is nature will actually, vol it will force you to harmonize with, with whatever the influence is in that environment. If you want to stay in that environment or that influence, then you will become a part of it just by the law of harmony, right? Now, if I go to like a million dollar round table meeting, which I have gone like in Australia like that, their vibe, their harmony, their their hypnotic rhythm, whatever you want to call it, is on a high level. Like these are high performing people. They're very um selfless. Like they'll share with you their best secrets. Just like what I'm doing with you right now. Uh, it makes me like feel like I'm getting smarter just when I'm next to them. Um and, and these people are fucking savage, like gangster shit. They work hard, really like highest levels of excellence of that so i want to be a part of that harmony right number seven the last principle caution so what does caution mean um the most dangerous thing is a lack of caution so this is coming from the devil ironic right the devil is teaching us to be cautious so what is a lack of caution he acts first and thinks later if at all or neglecting just neglecting a lot of stuff so what is caution? It's when a person carefully thinks his plans through. So caution is also some 
the poet hell asks, how about over caution? So the devil more accurately explain that caution is not the same as fear. So if someone is like over caution or like overthinking it, and it's more coming from the place of fear, then that's the devil, right? That's fear. Caution is the solution. So another way here is, uh, another note I put here was, selects closely uh, associates. And it's a helpful influence. So caution is like a guide. It's just, it's like a guide to make sure that, you know, something bad isn't going to happen, right? It's just being, I guess, prudent or thoughtful, being mindful, right? Hey, if I'm going to ride my motorcycle, it's another way. Is, it's like it's set up for success, right? That's caution, set up to win. A person without caution is like, set up to fail so that, that's how i would explain it more simply so we're getting close to the end seven out of eight um, pages so the public school system approaches the subject of education from the wrong angle to teach children to memorize facts so does that sound familiar right instead of teaching them how to use their own minds so napoleon hill was asking about schools churches not not to change the entire system but like what could be modified what could we do better right so traditionally public schools or a lot of schools actually even here in the philippines we're just taught to memorize and this ends up keeping you know children or people in ignorance so how do we serve people right how do we teach people to use their own minds? How do we do that? Here are quick examples, very concrete, enumerated by the devil, by giving children the privilege of leading instead of following. So when I took my quantum leap course with D. Harbecker, 2018 to 19, there, there are certain leadership courses there. I, I believe it was also like, step up and lead like i took the harbecker's online course version of it it's supposed to be like ultimate leadership um certification or the camp right and there was a term there second in command do i see so when you give that person the privilege of leading instead of following you're helping that person learn how to become a leader and this is the child right the child the children growing up let the instructors serve as students and let the students serve as instructors. So this requires a lot of humility because the traditional system is the teacher, whatever I say, you know, you follow. That's all that is. That's the way I grew up. But if this instructor, like right now, imagine if I'm doing this live and I'm saying, um, hey, I actually don't know the answer to this question right now. So people watching the live or watching the replay, uh, you could type down in the comments maybe you have an answer to this question maybe you have an answer to this to what i'm going through right now if i allow you right to be the instructor you could actually teach me and if i allow myself to be a student that's actually a solution that's actually the answer to this i'm helping other people use their own minds as well as myself the student can learn by doing. So I, I've been learning this also recently. Don't let the parent or the teacher like do, do everything for the child. Let them. So for example, real life example with my brother. Let's say I change the five gallon water, uh, bottle down in the water dispenser. So it, it, it took me a lot to do that. It's heavy. It's like almost forty five pounds. You know, it's uh, if you do what is hard, your life will be easy, right? It's very uncomfortable doing that. So if I allow other people, they're like, hey, I want to try that. I want to do that too. Allow the other person to do it. Don't, don't just say, no, let me do it. You don't know how to do it. Let them learn by doing it as well. I won't do everything for you, right? Teach children to be definite in all things beginning with the choice of a definite major purpose in life this one hit me again 
the most useful course I took back in 2019. This is like going on three or four years already. Mission to Millions. So that course taught me on what my mission or purpose in life is, right? So you could actually learn that. By the way, if, if someone, like, people who just want to know the goddamn truth, right? Like, some people think it's perfect. When I attended that course, there were some people, after finishing the course, they didn't know their purpose in life or their mission. And that's okay. Because the irony of it was, it was, a bit, I believe, a mother and a daughter. The daughter knew her purpose. The mother who brought her daughter along there to, for that course, right? That course wasn't cheap. The mother didn't know her purpose after taking that course. And that's okay. Because sometimes you will realize it after the course. Or sometimes you'll realize it later on. Like you take the course again. Or you take other things you work on other areas and then you realize it so next to express their own thoughts just like right now right those watching the live and the replay this is why i encourage you to also comment if there's a part that hit you like freaking timestamp or like comment or maybe share an experience like hey i could relate that helped me too or hey martin you missed this part actually Based on my personal experience, this was the answer to that. This one worked for me. So I encourage that. Express your own thoughts. It might actually help someone else or save someone's life. Do not forbid these evils. Just explain them. So he was talking, the devil was talking about sex, um, like alcohol, you know, cigarettes, stuff like that. I, I, I like the way this was said, like in this day and age, drugs, social media, all this stuff like that. Do not forbid these evils. Just explain them. So that's a very fine balance. Allow them to make mistakes. Allow them to have their freedom. But explain to them what could happen, which is what I'm doing right now. Last page, number eight. So last page of my best notes. The subconscious mind was actually mentioned in this audio book, um, not too heavily, but in my personal development courses, T. Har Becker, Tony Robbins, and then after that, this was just on my own research with, with Bob Proctor, who passed away um, in more recent years. He deals a lot with this, the subconscious mind. So when, when they said it's like a filing cabinet, the subconscious mind is like a filing cabinet system. This is actually what T. Harv Eker, the way he would explain it, like our mind has files in it that we can actually replace with better ones. So the subconscious mind is like that. So the thing about the subconscious mind is, so it's subconscious. So we have our conscious mind, right? The prefrontal cortex, our, our conscious, our thinking mind, willpower. The subconscious mind is like our more primitive brain, right? And buried deep down here are thoughts mixed with the greatest amount of emotion. So those are the ones that surface to the top easily. So maybe lessons on, let's say, trauma, right? Or why a person reacts a certain way a lot. A lot of it has to do with the subconscious mind. And again, as mentioned earlier, a lot of it is formed in our childhood. Zero to seven years old, formative years like that, which was mentioned earlier in, in this life right so the subconscious mind why is it important to understand this it has the power to set aside the control of the reasoning faculty so if ever you've seen anyone like, like panicking um there, there's this term i learned from my courses like high emotion low intelligence so when a person's just highly emotional they're just operating on their subconscious mind right so if ever you've seen someone do something really silly, it's because they're operating on their con subconscious mind. Likewise, maybe if someone is like in the zone or enlightened like that, and they weren't really thinking, maybe they work on their subconscious mind that it's actually more aligned with their infinite intelligence or, you know, higher self like that. So last note on subconscious minds, like our, our sixth sense is, that that moment right 
when the subconscious mind aligns with infinite intelligence. And people have done this. Um, was it Thomas Edison or that example of meditation? Like when he would almost fall asleep, he would like hold this metal ball that would drop and hit a metal plate. He would wake up. Those are the times he would have his most creative um, ideas. So you're in like that a theta state or like that subconscious mind state your brain waves and then it's it's aligned with infinite intelligence creativity that so next point all negative desires are nothing but frustrations of positive desires so what does this mean because napoleon hill was asking right like about negative desires or what how does that work so all negative desires are actually positive desires, but in a form of frustration. Why does this happen? It's inspired by some form of defeat, failure, or neglect. So that person who looks like they have a negative desire, they actually desired something positive. But then since something happened like defeat, failure, neglect, it becomes frustration it manifests as something negative so i remember this line of of tony robbins in one of his seminars he said anger is a tragic expression of an unmet need so when a person is feeling angry usually their desire was actually positive they wanted something they had a positive desire but since they were not be able to meet a need. Then they lash out in anger. It comes out as a negative, right? So next point that hit me, the Great Depression. Literally, they were going through this, right? 1929. He wrote this. He wrote this um his work, this Outwitting the Devil in 1938. All that the Great Depression is, is great thoughts of fear. That, that's how we explain that. And then on a mass level with, with a lot of people, maybe this might look or sound relatable, especially during like COVID, right? Like mass fear that could lead to a great depression, right? Or it could lead to war, right? Something like that. So that's all the root is. Anyone going through anxiety, depression, something like that, it made me realize. So what is really the root, right? The root. The root cause it's fear so a key here is stop fear and supplant it with faith so i love the way this was said because usually when someone says stop fear that won't work like where will the fear go right it just it just starts growing like weeds or mushrooms in your head right so supplant it with faith when I, when I heard that line, I was like, oh, so it's like I will uproot the fear from my garden and then I will plant something else in its place, right, with faith. And that's more much more relatable. Ironic, this was written in 1938 with all the freaking plantitos and plantitas now in 2013, right, ever since 2020, the COVID pandemic, you can actually plant plant something better in place of fear right which goes to this once dominating desires so what will i plant it with faith right it's your dominating desire definiteness of purpose plus definiteness of plans and then you use nature's law of hypnotic rhythm to serve you not destroy you combined with time so that's like the formula. So last part to end this live, to benefit from all this, people watching the live, the replay, you know, you need not agree with every portion of it. You only have to think and to reach your own conclusions concerning every part of it. So if there was any part here that hit you, the parts that hit me, I marked them already with a drawing there exclamation point heads up hey a key this is a solution light bulb man this is a aha moment i i can see things clearly a star man like this is 
this is something like this is, this is a really good point or a fire marker right like man this my mind's on fire here like the benefits you will receive from it will be an exact proportion to the thought that inspires in you so that is it for so thank you how do I here go back to this? All right, guys. So those are my lessons, my best lessons from Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. I hope you got this. Chris, I just saw your comment right now, man. So, man, yeah, this book is my new Bible, really. So thank you, Chris, for this comment earlier. Uh, I feel like I'm going to listen to the audio book again. It's really cool when you hear the voice of the devil. <laughs> That's that's my reason how how it kept me engaged too. Plus the content too, as you can see, the best lessons there really, right? So thank you for that. Um, I love you, and I will see you next time.